bringing in to the I'm bringing into the equation my Sports Illustrated alum and author author see that author of one of the <laughs> best books I have read this year, Blood in the Garden. Chris Herring in the building. What is up? Thank you for having me and for the the really pleasant introduction. I appreciate you. One of the best books I have read this year, one of the best sports books I've read, you know, my entire life. If you guys have not checked that book out, even if you're not a Knicks fan, if you're just a basketball enthusiast, historian, you will love, love, love what Chris did with that book. But guys, let's react. Shams, James Harden taking a $15 million pay cut, showing that he is not the selfish player that a lot of people have tried to make him out to be. What do you guys make of that, Chris? I'll start with you. I, I, I think it's a nice framing. Uh, he was always kind of, I won't say always, but for the last few weeks, it's kind of been reported that he would take something in the low to mid thirties um, for next season. It, it's, I mean, he, he did not play well at the end of last year. If it was injury, if it was a lack of enthusiasm, you know, each time from Brooklyn when Kyrie was out and, um, and obviously Kevin Durant was hurt to then the situation where he goes to Philly and then Embiid is out because of, uh, you know, basically got his face broken. Harden ended up being the guy. And the whole reason he went to Brooklyn, part of it at least, was so that he would not have to be the guy. So for whatever reason, he looked poor last year. He didn't look good. He's starting to age. So the longevity play for somebody like him at that point is on some level an opportunity to kind of prove that he's worth more than what he showed last year. Um, And also, as he's starting to get older, to kind of get someone that will commit more years to him for less money. Um, more years, it's still 30 plus million a year is better than one year of 47 million. And then for us to see that he's not good anymore. I don't think that he's not good anymore, but he did take a really bad step back last season. So this is an opportunity for him to kind of guarantee and lock himself into more money if he wants it that way. Um, and yeah, I guess you could view it as being generous as well, but uh, I, I think this was always kind of the most realistic step for him as opposed to just opting into a one-year deal. You, you know, you, you Michael, hit it right on the head James, right there. James, Hart, James Harden is fresh from Michael Rubin's all-white party in the Hamptons. You think he said a little something, something on the side like, hey, let me talk to you real quick. I, I know we're at a party, <laughs> but let's, let's talk some business real quick. I need you to take a pay cut because you didn't show me what you needed to show me. And if you show me what you need to show me, then we can go ahead and reassess this later down the road. Let's go have a drink. We'll talk about this later on after the fourth. (laughs) No, they they didn't need to have that conversation. The the film speaks for itself. I mean, we're talking about a $15 million pay cut. James Harden could have signed for the mid-level the way he was playing. I mean, we're talking about a a two-time MVP player who just kind of like fell off. And we saw it happening in Brooklyn, you know, but, you know, some people will say, okay, well, he didn't want to be there. He was dogging it. No, he came in out of shape. We saw him turning the ball over uncharacteristically. Field goal percentage was poor. And then you thought that a change of scenery would improve those numbers. And it was just inconsistent. I think as soon as he got to Philly, you started seeing some of those numbers pick up. And then you started seeing them taper off again. Um, Obviously, I was joking about mid-level. We all know what caliber player James Harden is. But the idea that he's being generous by, by giving giving back 15 million. No, that's about market value for a player his age who's clearly being worn down right now. Um, I'm interested to see what version of James Harden we're going to get this season. Are we going to get the one who we remember attacking everybody, getting to the rim, hitting step back threes? Are we going to see the guy who we saw in Brooklyn, we saw in Philadelphia this year, which is that facilitator who wants to get everybody else involved? I hope for his sake we see a very good mix of the two different James Hardens we've seen because that team is going to need him to be aggressive if they're going to win a championship this year. Let me pose this question to the both of you. We look at the saga of James Harden from last season, right? And Brooklyn, there was a lot of chaos on the court, off the court. Obviously, Kyrie Irving, the part-time player thing, it went ahead and affected the chemistry of the team. Kevin Durant was dealing with injury and things like that. James Harden, as you said, wasn't in the best of shape. But them not being able to play together was probably a huge catalyst and the reason why that team did not work at the speed in which it was intended to work, right? But then you go to the 76ers and you have a couple of glimpses of him where it looks like him and Embiid automatically have a better chemistry. But again, wasn't a lot of time to go ahead and get that implemented either. Then Joel Embiid gets hurt in the playoffs. James Harden now has to carry the lows with a team he's not familiar with, with a system and a coach he has not been in. Does having a full season change your opinion on what James Harden will be able to do? Absolutely. You know, I think, 
you know, covering the Nets and, and realizing how important training camp was for them and them not having it, not having Kyrie Irving for that training camp, you know, that kind of derailed their season. Having James Harden in a training camp, having this roster full in training camp for Philly, it's going to work wonders for them. I think it's going to help everybody settle into their roles. Uh, I think we still got to figure out whether even Tobias Harris is going to be part of this team moving forward. Um, but once that roster is set and you've got everybody in training camp, now you're going to have everybody just understanding their roles, understanding their position on the floor. Um, I can't wait. I want to see what the Sixers look like because, to your point, Joel Embiid and, Joe, and, James, and James Harden on the floor together, I mean, that's a duo made in basketball heaven right you got the the perimeter threat you got the post threat I mean who doesn't want to see that but we just want it to work Chris I'm, I'm I'm wondering if you think that this is something that can go further than what we've seen which has just been what a second round that's it he's way he's weighing his options uh, he's not a believer yeah, point yet. I, I, I mean for I, I was gonna I would say for the sake of the show I'll just take the opposite stance I I think the opposite stance is kind of the one I would take naturally anyway though uh maybe we can attribute the struggles last year to the fact that the free throw, not the free throw rules, but the obviously the the rules that related to kind of trying to draw fouls intentionally and uh, initiating contact that that was going to really impact somebody like him and a Trey Young or a Luka Doncic and stuff like that. So he wasn't getting to the line as much. Uh, he struggled just, you know, he throws up a lot of junk a lot of times trying to get foul calls. So he was missing a lot of those shots trying to draw fouls. He just didn't look great to start the season. You know, if it was injury or just being slowed and hampered by certain things, uh, if it was that Kyrie wasn't there, whatever the case was, he went to Philly and looked good, like you said, for those five or six games where they were untouchable. And then he kind of came back down to earth. But who can forget the fact that when the playoffs rolled around, yes, some of it was on his own, particularly in that heat series when Embiid was out. But even once he came back, Embiid said, we, we kind of need more from James. And, yeah. you know, as much as I really want to believe in Philly, as much as I really want to believe in James Harden, the playoff boogeyman, I, I wouldn't even call it a boogeyman where it's a real thing for him. It's just not a stage that he generally performs really, really great on, at least in the latter stages of the postseason. I do think their roster around him is improved. Um, I'm curious to see what happens. Like Christian was saying about, is there another move that they make? Is Tobias Harris part of this team? If he's not, He's got a massive salary that you're going to probably be getting a couple of things back for him that maybe fit the team better. So it's possible. I just don't know if all of it would be because of James Harden. If they take a step forward, he would be a part of it, but I don't know if he's the biggest reason that they would make the jump forward. I think I this want, roster around him is improved. I want to go to the top of the pyramid for a second and talk about Doc Rivers because it was reported towards the end of the 76ers season that Doc Rivers and James Harden did not have a good chemistry. It was no secret that James Harden was rallying for Dan Antoni to get that job in the event that Doc Rivers were to leave and go elsewhere. Obviously, that didn't happen. He is still the head coach of the 76ers. But I'm interested. You have a guy who has a player-coach relationship that did not seem to have any type of chemistry. They were on two separate pages. Doc Rivers did not seem to know how to even utilize James Harden in a lot of the right situations at a lot of the right times. Does that fix itself or is that relationship something that you're very worried about going into next season simply because they're two totally different styles of people and that results in two totally different styles of viewing the game? Um... I'll say this, I watched James Harden play basketball under Steve Nash, you know, and, and I think Doc Rivers is a different category of head coach. Listen, when, when James Harden got traded, I believe one of the first things he said was, you know, who wouldn't want to be coached by someone like Doc Rivers? And obviously acquiring someone in the middle of the season is going to be growing pains, right? You have to learn somebody on the fly. That's why I think this training camp is going to be so important for them. You're going to have everybody getting on the same page. I'm not necessarily worried about the relationship. I, I am worried a bit about the narrative about Doc Rivers. And it's not really just a narrative. I mean, he struggled in the playoffs at times, right? He's got one ring with the Boston Celtics. But other than that, what, what has he done in terms of leading teams to a championship, right? I think he, in many ways, he's kind of on trial, right? If he can't get this team over the hump this year, I wouldn't be surprised to see him gone. Uh, but I do think that we're going to see them work some of the kinks in that relationship out this offseason in training camp. And I think they're going to have a strong start to the season. Chris, I want to ask you, while I still have you, I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about the New York Knicks. My New York Knicks, who, you know, tend to be the bane of my existence in the sports world. Um, Jalen Duren had a very nice showing 
again um in the summer league the Detroit Pistons he played 12 minutes nine points one rebound so very impressive for such a short amount of time I made no secret about drastically desperately wanting Jalen Dern in a New York Knicks uniform I had him for about 25 seconds and then he was ripped away from me I want to ask, is this something that the Knicks are going to regret? Obviously, they just paid Mitchell Robinson four years, $60 million. Christian was very critical of that contract, said, "Mm, seems a little high for someone of Mitchell Robinson's caliber. Obviously, Jericho Sims is supposed to be the version of Jalen Duran. But do you think the Knicks missed the mark or not keeping him or trying to keep him? I'm going to be real. I'll admit this. And and I wonder if Christian feels the same way, just as someone that covers the NBA and does it really intensely for a full you know season it's really difficult to cover the league and pay really close attention to the draft prospects as well i know that there's a lot of video there's a lot of uh kind of investigating that other people do of these players and you know how they play and what systems they play who they're playing against i don't even try to pretend that i get a chance to do both i'm, I'm so kind of wrapped <laughs> in the nba during the season now what i will say is that the knicks made a gamble Time will tell whether it was a smart one or not about the fact that they wanted to open up cap space for Jalen Brunson. They also wanted to try to collect more assets for the possibility of, you know, in the future being able to trade for a star. So that was the choice they made. Uh, It was interesting to see in what people thought to be a pretty strong draft to watch them trade down repeatedly. So it absolutely could burn them. There probably will be someone lower down in the draft that they passed on or chose not to use a pick on that will be really, really good. And like clockwork, we'll hear Stephen A and everybody else criticize the fact that the Knicks did that. When someone kind of like a Donovan Mitchell kind of, you know, is better than a lot of people were assuming he would be, that will be a criticism that will be lobbed at the Knicks and other teams too, but at the Knicks most loudly. And that's something that they always have to be prepared for. Um, But we can't really judge any of this until we see what do the Knicks cash in all these assets that they have? What is it, nine? first rounders they have over the next four or five years or something like that until yeah, they cash those in for picks. something it, 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 what we will see then what they use it for if there's not a, a worthwhile player to use it for or if they use it on a player where it's not really worth it then we can criticize it openly whether Jalen Duran is good or not because they still could have used it on somebody else if not him you know Christian Jalen Duran obviously NBA ready physically obviously there's going to be a lot of things that he needs to improve on in his game like most rookies do but Mitchell Robinson was a a player that Knicks fans were on the fence about. I being one of them that was on the opposite side of the fence of a lot of other Knicks fans. I was okay with letting him walk if Jalen Duran fell into our lap, which he did. Went ahead and and traded him to be part of that Jalen Brunson package. You went ahead and traded Jalen Duran to go ahead and go to Detroit and pay Mitchell Robinson. Is that something that you would have done? And how are you feeling about it in hindsight? You know, I, I'm not too mad about the deal as long as we see some maturation in Mitchell Robinson's game. Mm. Um, I think he's got that frame and the size and the athleticism. We see he jumps out the gym. He can block floaters that are going above the backboard. We know what type of, of talent he is. But can he stay on the floor? Can he stay out of foul trouble? Can he make the advanced reads as a big man that you kind of have to be able to make uh, just to stay on the floor? Um, so it, it's interesting. To Chris's point, you know, it's difficult to have your tabs on a specific team all year long and then also be watching college basketball to know who's coming up. So I haven't watched too much of, of Jalen Duran. I'm kind of taking what you've said, and you've been significantly impressed with him. Um, well, so I interviewed it, it just... him at, the, at Memphis. I interviewed him, and I was impressed even back then with his build. I just yeah. alone, his, his physicality for someone so young, it looked like he had been in the weight room in an NBA facility for at least four years. I mean, the yeah. guy is huge, and he, he, he's a talent. Again, not perfect. Nobody in the draft is perfect. Everyone needs to go ahead and improve some way, shape, or form. But just like you, Mitchell Robinson, for everything that he brings, I'm concerned about the things that he doesn't bring and the speed in which he has uh, has effectively gotten better at them. I haven't seen that happen fast enough. And then also, you know, I've spoken about this. I'm a little bit worried about his maturity off the court. There's been a Mm. lot of instances where you know, there's subliminal messaging, whether it's in his Instagram stories and his tweets and, you know, a young team, it's very easy to go in the opposite direction. And I don't want to see them become Twitter fingers. I want to keep all your fingers on the ball for when it counts, when we need you to go ahead and win games. If he can do that, 
I'm very excited for him to prove me wrong. I hope that he does. So you you know I've seen some of those Instagram posts where the 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 next the Knicks will have just lost by like 20, and he's on Instagram on his stories talking about well I had five blocks in the game, so I did what I'm right. supposed to do. That's not what you want to see from your from your starting center or your your franchise centerpiece at that position. But at the same time, I think the Knicks are hoping that he develops and matures over these next couple of years because I think if you have a Mitchell Robinson with his head on straight, you know that's a starting caliber center for for the next six, seven years. I'm more concerned about Jalen Brunson, right, and, and whether that was the right decision to make at your point guard and whether or not the, the Knicks are actually building around him for the future or if he's potentially a trade chip two years, a year from now, maybe if Donovan Mitchell becomes available. I still want to see Donovan Mitchell back in New York. He's, he's a hometown hero. We want to see him here. Um, I'm just not sold on Jalen Brunson as the guy who's going to carry the, the Knicks into the next because you guys don't want to be second round exit you guys want to be Eastern right. Conference Finals NBA Finals I'm just concerned that there's a ceiling on how good you can be with Jalen Brunson as your starting point guard and he's gonna have to prove me wrong Chris I want to ask you before I let you go I mean I was one of the people who were a little bit uh mm, side-eyeing this move it seemed like you know not an you know, an asinine amount of money, but it seemed like a hefty paycheck for someone that we really only have one impressive season to gauge off of. And even in the playoffs, you know, after that first series, his points per game, you know, kind of fell down the ladder a little bit. But it was very interesting because the conversation, the narrative was Jalen Brunson is not the savior. He's not the savior. He's not going to be the one to bring a championship. He's not going to be the one to change this Knicks franchise around. But on the other side of that, it was almost treating him like the savior with all the things that were done behind the scenes to go ahead and make this happen, all the moving pieces, and ultimately paying a tampering fine for going ahead and getting him to New York. What what do you make of the whole saga? And did the Knicks do a little bit too much to get someone who's not even top 10 in his position? I think that, honestly speaking, the hype around it was significant. I think, you know, again, kind of involving Christian in this, it's the New York media market. There's twice as many newspapers as most major cities have in New York. Um, so there's a lot of people reporting about it. He was on a playoff team that was making a run that, you know, people were making note of the fact that the Knicks had some of their people at his games. <laughs> that that's happened before that was complained about before when Kawhi Leonard was doing his thing and um you know and the Clippers had people at his games before so it had been that that stuff has happened before it gets more attention when it happens in New York it always does mm. he's being paid like an average starting point guard which seems like a lot considering that the Knicks haven't had really anybody worth a damn at the starting point guard in a decade uh he's not a savior type player. I think all of us can look at him and say that he's got deficiencies. He's not great on defense. He's not really a traditional point guard. As far as distributing the ball, he was not the lead ball handler on his team. He was a backup point guard on his team. Um, so no, he's not a savior. He is someone that can take over for, for stretches. The, the truth here is that RJ Barrett's development is the most important thing in this franchise right now. And I would say the next most important thing is, a tie between figuring out what you're doing with Julius Randle and figuring out what you cash in all those chips on. Uh, if Absolutely. you don't handle those two things properly, the rest of it does not matter. You can talk about Jalen Brunson, 104 million, too much money, not enough money, too much doing, too much going on behind the scenes to uh, attain him and obtain him. It, none of it will matter if they don't find a second or a third guy and figure out what they're doing with Randall or how to make him more comfortable. It, it, it is irrelevant. And, uh, and I feel like too much attention has been paid to Jalen Brunson when really he needs to be the first step in a series of things to get them to where you're talking about to be a, a conference finalist, an NBA finalist. He's not, of course, he's not the guy. And I think most of us can look at that, but I do feel like it's been a little bit overhyped just because it's the first time the Knicks have spent big in a while and spent big at that position in a long while. Listen, it's not being overpaid if that's what they're going to go ahead and offer you. That's the lesson of the day, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Chris Herring, thank you so much for joining us. As always, a pleasure speaking to you, and we will be back. Hey, thanks for watching Brother from Another on YouTube. Make sure you hit subscribe before you leave, and be sure to watch us 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time on Peacock. Appreciate you.